Good morning. I'm Carla Bello, President and CEO of the Center for Automotive Research, and I'd like to welcome you to MBS 2020, our very first time for a totally virtual event. This morning, the MBS is going to be kicked off with a conversation between Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist and John Bozella. John Bozella is the president and CEO for the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. They're going to be giving us a fabulous outline of how the automotive industry has really helped support um, the state of Michigan as well as the nation in the, in the production of PPE equipment, how the automotive industry has really stepped up in the time of the country's demand. And then what are the challenges that the automotive industry is facing and why these are particularly relevant for the state and what is happening in order to support the overall industry, um, the OEMs and the suppliers. We'll talk a little bit also about the impact of racial inequality, what that means, how companies are dealing with that and what actions they're taking and again, the impact that this has for the state. If you have not yet registered for MBS, you still have time to do that. You're very welcome to do so. And if you don't have time to join us for the full two days on Zoom, you'll be able to watch the sessions afterwards as well. They'll be available for up to six months on our website and in the uh, uh, virtual formats website. You can register at cargroup.org events MBS. Look forward to seeing you all there. And without further ado, I'll hand this over to the Lieutenant Governor and John Bozella. Thank you. You know, it's, it's really, um, I know you're very busy. There's so much going on in our world right now. Um, I thought we'd start with COVID-19, if that's okay with you. Um, you know, from an auto industry perspective, obviously from the very beginning, the health and safety of our employees, our customers, and the communities in which we operate were first and foremost in our minds. And we really focused initially on responding to the crisis in that way. And then of course, being able to shift even to the production of personal uh, protective equipment and important medical devices like ventilators and respirators and those types of things. And of course, now we've restarted production again. And so what I, what I wonder is, as you look at the path of the pandemic and you continue your robust response uh, here in the state of Michigan, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what, the, what are you looking at? at? What are the key metrics and guideposts and measures of progress that you're looking at to make sure that we are progressing safely and effectively through the pandemic? Well, first off, again, I want to acknowledge exactly what you're talking about as far as the fact that industry in Michigan, the auto industry, our manufacturing, our whole supply chain um, really stepped up and really, I think, rose to the challenge in terms of doing um, what they could do as, as whether it's corporate leaders employees uh, stepping up to meet this this really great need that we had you know in the state of michigan we were one of the hardest hit states and you know we needed all hands on deck and so that meant uh companies being able to be flexible and to shift their you know the the, the, the whole notion of shifting production that is not a trivial exercise and the fact that that happened i think really speaks to the gravity of the moment and, and the commitment that, that companies show to their communities. Now, when thinking about, you know, as we move through this pandemic and as we move forward, you know, we are watching very closely. So our, um, our you know, health department with the leadership of our chief medical executive, Dr. Jonay Khaldun, we're watching very closely what's happening with the trends in the sort of number of cases that we're seeing in different parts of the state as well as you know things like our public health system capacity overall so our you know hospital uh, room capacity hospital bed capacity intensive care unit bed capacity our pipeline for protect personal protective equipment one of the things that to realize we have to build an entire supply chain related to all these materials because PPE is one time use generally speaking and so we have to have a robust supply chain for things like surgical masks and gloves and gowns and 
and and you know the the footies to cover people's shoes like all these things we have to have a pipe uh, supply chain for so we're watching all of our capacities in that regard and you can see a lot of that data we've made available to the public for the michigan my safe start uh website that's a, sort of a dashboard for the different regions of the state um another Another thing that we're looking at really closely is working with uh, companies in the industry. You know, as you talked about what the number one priority was, and it's protecting our people, which is the same priority that myself and Governor Whitmer have, protecting our people, keeping our keeping people safe. Well, companies have worked hard to develop workplace protocols that are mitigating the risks that are associated with different types of work, with different job functions. And so we certainly are watching very closely um, companies working with, whether that's MIOSHA, the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity, et cetera, to submit their workplace safety plans, plans to do things that are kind of on a basic and practical level. Like if you have a manufacturing facility, it more than likely works on shifts. And we want to, we're trying to minimize the gatherings of people and shift changes lead to a lot of people going through a very specific place in a very short period of time. So uh, asking companies to be creative with their facilities management about how they are managing those things like shift changes and stuff like that, it really, it really matters. And so um, on the data side, we have to make sure that we have the enough public health infrastructure capacity to be able to meet the needs of people who may get sick. We also need to make sure that um, we're working and partnering with organizations to mitigate the risks to the community to try to limit the spread of the virus. That's why we've been so heavily focused on things like the Mask Up Michigan campaign. And I know that our manufacturers have been quite uh, vigilant about ensuring that people were masked up on the inside. And so that's actually a good model for the rest of our employers across the state of Michigan. You know, and 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 um, as, as you're aware, the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, while we're a new organization, we represent the industry broadly. Um, um, more than 35 companies that are not only uh, uh, equip, original equipment manufacturers or uh, auto uh, producers, but also suppliers and tech companies and new entrants to the space. And so we do look at this entire value chain and, and I think it is important that uh, whether we're large businesses or medium-sized businesses or small businesses, that we continue to work uh, on these health and safety protocols. And I, I was uh, pleased to hear you recognize that cooperation because I think that has been essential from the very beginning uh, to make sure um, that we have those protocols, that we have those protocols in place. Um, well, well, John, you know, everybody has a role to play. And I think that's what's most important and I think what's been made most clear and most evident in our collective COVID-19 response. We all have both a responsibility and an obligation to um, commit ourselves to being part of how we get through this together. And so I, I'm proud that uh, companies across Michigan have stepped up to play their part. Yeah, and I, and I think it, it, it also, it's about workers as well, right? We're, we're seeing cooperation on the on the plant floor and in office spaces all around the state, right? The opportunity for to make sure that we are focused on protecting uh, employees, but also that we're doing it in a way uh, that's cooperative and uh, you know includes that type of engagement. So you know we we have to continue to work on it. Obviously, um, yeah, you know, our, it, yeah, totally. I mean, our our people are our everything. They they, they are the resource. Uh, in the state of Michigan. Our people are our economy, both on the production and consumption side of the equation. And so uh, there's there's an implicit, it's funny like how it's exposed and wow. that like so much of our society, our economic model is based on this implicit assumption that when you emerge from your home to go to work or to go consume a service or, or, or consume products, that you are going to be safe doing so. And if there are increased risks to you leaving, then it's our responsibility to do everything that we can to mitigate those risks. And sometimes that means staying home in the first place, which is where we were in the earlier part of the spring. And now, uh, because of the progress that we've made and the fact that people in Michigan have stepped up, it's that there are activities that we can resume, understanding that there is risk and then doing everything we can, like masking up to mitigate that risk. And that's true because our people are what matters. If we do not have our people safe, healthy, and confident that they will be healthy, um, the model doesn't work. And so that's why it's so important. Yes, you know, I, the, Michigan is the automotive leader, not only in terms of production, but also innovation. And I wanna come back to innovation in a second, but before we leave 
we leave COVID, you know, we, we rely, the industry relies, and frankly, Michigan relies on a broad supply chain uh, that crosses state boundaries and frankly, crosses international boundaries. And so, um, you know, we, we certainly have watched uh, and, and, and appreciated Michigan's leadership in, in recognizing the essential nature of auto production and manufacture and innovation. Um, what, what more do you think we need to be doing to make sure that there's alignment across the value chain and across state and, and maybe even international borders to ensure uh, Michigan is continuing to produce and continuing to innovate? Well, that spirit of collaboration is something also that has, I think, been highlighted. It's, it's necessity has been highlighted during this pandemic response. Uh, we have taken a regional approach uh, in the state of Michigan, uh, the governor convening a table with her counterparts in states like Ohio and Indiana and Kentucky and Wisconsin. And I have also convened um, with my counterparts in Midwest Lieutenant Governors. We've talked about everything from the fact that our manufacturing chains are so connected in the Midwest, the fact that our agricultural sector is so connected, that like we are our, our people, we, we, have, we have family and colleagues and everything in all these different places. And so we need to work together because COVID moves across boundaries, mm. you know, wherever, whatever they may be, whether it's moving to, to Ohio or Ontario. And so we have to uh, be, be mindful of that. And so we've tried to work together with our partners and our counterparts to make sure that we are not only considering one another when we build solutions, and, and um, but recognizing also that our economies are inextricably linked. And so we are really proud, for example, to see the state of Ohio step up yesterday um, with a uh, with an order for people to wear masks when they are leaving their homes and going to indoor places of of uh, in, indoor indoor anything um, and then outside when they can't be uh, safe and socially distant and that's important because we would what we would hate to see is for people whether they may live in Michigan and work in another state or vice versa uh, or whether they're going for to visit another place for another reason um, to get sick and put themselves and their family at risk and bring it back home and so. Sure. Uh, we're trying to be careful and that partnership between states and, and across boundaries with Canada, I mean, is really, really critical to making sure that there are as few um, holes as possible in this response. That's so important. You know, so let's get back to innovation. You, you, you're a, a software engineer, a, a, a tech person by training and by experience, both in the private sector and the public sector. So, so you've been at the forefront and in the middle of this tremendous tech transformation that you're seeing uh, really across society. And of course, we're seeing that and driving that in the automotive industry, right? Sort of the digitization of personal mobility, uh, the opportunity to save lives with more highly automated uh, safety features in vehicles, the, I, the ability to move toward no carbon personal transportation with electric drive technology. So all of this innovation is happening. Michigan is in the middle of it and at the forefront of it. What more should we be doing as an industry with uh, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, with the Center for Automotive Research, the industry? How can we continue to make sure that, that, that we can drive that leadership to produce that value in Michigan and here in the United States? Well, you know, we have a history of making this happen uh, in, in our state, as you know, and so uh, we need to look to that for inspiration. And I think it's recognizing uh, the fact that as, well, what, what is innovation really, right? So uh, the way that I think about it, is innovation is simply doing something that is new, different, better, and more valuable to more people. And so as we approach any problem, any challenge, any opportunity, I think if we have those five things in mind when we're talking about innovation, is there a new way I can approach this that is distinct from what I used to do, but that can create more value, or that can scale in a different way, that's something that's worth trying because the scale of, of the COVID-19 crisis and the scale of its impact across social and economic life necessitates bigger thinking and larger scale uh, solutions. Um, you know, no one has, I mean, let's just do, for example, um, whether it's like our unemployment system that's seen more uh, claims than ever in the history of unemployment, or whether it's the fact that there have never needed to be this many pairs of latex gloves in the state of Michigan. So um, I think 
my my goal and focus when we're thinking about how we innovate is really thinking about how we scale. And I think that the professionals and the researchers and the thinkers here in Michigan understand scale uh, better than anybody and understand how to make things at scale and to move ideas at scale. And so that that's the, the I think, the characteristic that I'm most interested in, is that, that more value to more people um, is, is what's important. And so I think if we're able to, to center um, our, our focus on how we can have solutions that will scale statewide, nationwide, globally, I think that positions us to continue to be a leader um, in, in, in making solutions. And I guess to speak to what you're talking about in terms of technology and mobility broadly is something I'm very, very interested in. And I think that um, this, this will, I think, shift our thinking about the, the problems we need to solve in the short term when it comes to mobility. Like that, that we now have an opportunity to put in place some really interesting solutions around what it, what shared mobility actually looks like. I mean, whether it's from the most basic level in terms of public transportation, and I'm speaking as a person, I, I don't know if folks know this, but like um, I uh, I had to get picked up when I joined uh, Governor Whitmer's campaign because I'm a bus, I was a bus rider and not a driver. <laughs> so, um, but thinking about what does it, shared mobility look like? What does shared public transit infrastructure look like when we are concerned about a transmissible disease? So we've got to do things from a workplace protocol perspective, but there are design opportunities. We have companies that exist in the state of Michigan that have truly innovative solutions when it comes to, you know, UV disinfecting at scale um, to, to look to, to with, with surfaces and things like that. Can we scale up and deploy those solutions in the public sector? That would be amazing. And imagine the number of people it would reach. Can we look at, you know, what kind of protocols need to be happening? How can vehicles be designed differently that are optimized for for, share, for ride share and things like that? Um, what does it mean to have a different relationship with your mobility device, whatever it may be? So I, I'm, I'm very interested in these questions. And I think that the, the, the innovators in Michigan are, are, are well positioned to solve them. That's fantastic. And I love these ideas that you've put together, the notion of scale. Scale is so critical. And what we've seen is the industry be able to use scale, the broad, the breadth and, and, and depth of supply chains, for example, to produce PPE and medical devices, you know, the, the breadth of innovation being brought to bear on the challenges. And it is, there's a lot of uncertainty, but that uncertainty I hear you saying provides us with opportunities to innovate. So I, I think those are really powerful ideas and, and ideas that we ought to be talking about, whether we're the, in the industry or whether we're in academia, the Center for Automotive Research, MEDC, I think we have an opportunity to continue to drive that. I want to I want to um, kind of br bring in another another idea here. Th this idea with the, the, the critical importance of and, and the challenges we're facing with regard to racial justice. Um, you know, we, we've, we've heard leaders in the automotive industry and leaders across uh, the business community in Michigan uh, really uh, address with powerful words the need for equity and inclusion and the fact that racism and hate have no business in our companies and in our industry and frankly in society, of course. And so, um, and, and you see companies focusing on actions. What 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 can we as industry be doing to continue to to drive that forward and what types of partnerships ought we be looking at uh, with government leaders like you and, and and with the private sector with the public sector more broadly sure so i do think that it is important that we have had such a high level of public acknowledgement of the impact of racism and prejudice as it has led to um, inequitable access to opportunity. Broadly speaking, that is a good thing. I think what is important going forward is how that translates into a sort of a, a, a change in reality in our communities. And one of the things that companies can do that I think is uh, simple in concept but requires courage and execution is to take a hard look at, you know, what is the experience of being recruited to, being employed in, advancing in leadership in your organization? That is something that you have control over as a leader. Um, 
cultures don't happen. Cultures are designed, cultures are manufactured, culture, cultures are created, and cultures are sustained, and cultures can be changed with commitment. And so I think the question that, that companies need to ask themselves and corporate leaders need to ask themselves is what kind of environment, what kind of pathways are we creating for people truly to grow into being their, their, best, their best professional selves in my place of business? And are those pathways truly available to everyone? And are we recognizing that we have an opportunity to create more equity in how those pathways are, are truly accessible? And so that means taking a look at, you know, if, if you have a company that let's say you start out in a good place, you have decent representation of, of women and, and non-white people when it comes to entry level positions. But even when you get to that first level of management, that representation falls off a cliff. Maybe you need to ask some different questions about how you define what it takes to be a manager um, and to what it takes to be a decision maker, who you trust as a decision maker. And then that goes on up the, uh, up the org chart all the way to the to the C-suite and to the board level. And I think it's objectively true that we see um, significant underrepresentation. If you look at the set of people who uh, pursue entrepreneurial activity, people of color are actually overrepresented in that. But when you look at sort of the C-suites and some of our most uh, you know, our most profitable and successful companies, like they don't have that same kind of representation of it's not it's not a cross section of entrepreneurs. And so I think we need to think honestly about that and, and really commit to changing the pipeline and pathways for people to be uh, to be to have access to that kind of opportunity. And uh, and I think that's successful. I think it is doable because if there's anything that our companies in Michigan have shown is that we can do stuff if we put our mind to it. So putting our mind to this culture change question. Um, will be critical to changing the reality when it comes to um, how people of color are able to fully participate in the opportunities and the growth of our economy and be able to have positions of leadership and influence within that economy that are, you know, consistent with their skills and talent um, not and not cut short by any sort of prejudice. That's so, so, such, an, such an important set of ideas you know you know, you mentioned pipeline um and and there are, you you gave a couple of really good examples of, of of pipeline to senior executive ranks and those types of things i want to focus on another pipeline that you're showing that you're, you're working i think very hard and effectively on in michigan which is the stem pipeline the opportunity to uh, really uh, continue to improve and build uh stem education uh in the state of michigan and provide opportunities uh, for students broadly uh, to be able to build those skills, because that's all obviously a critical uh, pipeline for an innovative, cutting edge, high tech industry uh, like the automotive industry to be able to have uh, engineering talent and mathematics talent and computer science talent coming into uh, the industry. So tell us a little bit more about what the state of Michigan is doing and what you're working on to to drive STEM education. So you know that does have an important role to play going forward and um so yes i i uh, went to engineering school at michigan i uh was also as a child i benefited from exposure opportunities like the detroit area pre-college engineering program dapsep um that ex that gave me a chance to you know take a dapsep class at the chrysler headquarters in auburn hills and go to the chelsea proving grounds and and be able to um you know be on at the uh GM Tech Center in Warren and stuff like that. Like I saw these things and that exposed me to engineering. And it's not an accident that the state of Michigan, Southeast Michigan in particular, has the highest concentration of engineering talent in the country. Um, and I think that we want to make it clear that these are viable career pathways for young people. Um, and so investing in those exposure opportunities that like we've continued to do in state government by things like DAPSEP and there's a similar program in Grand Rapids or the FIRST Robotics program or other kinds of things, like that's really critical. And I think those are good experiences. I do want to caution though, like I think that our companies, even if we are companies, there are companies that are whether they're primarily manufacturing businesses or primarily engineering businesses, we do need a diverse set of people in terms of the way they approach problem solving to um to come into to come into these ranks so while i like i said look i was educated in stem i think that that is incredibly important i i want to be careful 
to not pigeonhole our education system going forward. So I want to make sure that we are making investments. So to give you a very concrete example, um, I think the focus of STEM, um, even particularly whether it's at the high school and the college level, has led to us actually underinvesting and making sure that our kids who are getting training in STEM also can write and communicate well. And one of those barriers, for example, to growth in your career or growth at a company is not being able to communicate well. And it's hard to be a good manager. You can't communicate and you can't write. And so I want to make sure that as we are arming um, students with STEM experiences, that they are coupled and balanced with those kinds of the kinds of skill building that will enable people truly to be uh, successful and influential because they have these sort of transferable uh, skills that when coupled with science, technology, engineering, and math can really lead to creating people who can experience robust success. So I, I you know, I, um, I think that's really important. It's certainly been important to my journey in my career, being able to walk both of those lines. And I think that if we can create a set of people, a new generation of emerging professionals that are armed with both of those, um, then we will have a truly amazing uh, set of leaders. And we'll see yet another generation of, of, of leaders in the national and international level who can look back to their training and education in Michigan and be proud of that. The last piece I'll mention is um, one of the things that um, we have committed to as an administration is something called the Michigan Reconnect Program. And the Reconnect Program uh, provides a, a tuition-free pathway for professional training and certification in community college education for every Michigander over the age of 25. And I think that's important because one element of this skill building is also people going and deciding they want to change and build a different set of skills. And so whether that's you're doing this the first time you went to college or the next time you go to college, we wanted to be clear to people in Michigan that the state of Michigan values and will invest in your education to be the professional who you want to be. And a lot of those experiences are for very technical, you know, certifications, network, network analysts and, you know, robotics and all sorts of things. And that's really important because those specific skill sets have tremendous value when it comes to um, the different companies that are doing different sorts of, you know, for the physical or virtual innovation in our economy in Michigan. This is fantastic. I want to I want to, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. This was really a fantastic discussion. You know, we could go on for hours on, on any of these topics. And I think from, a, from the perspective of the auto industry, certainly, um, we, you know, for those of us who are at the intersection of innovation and public policy, uh, to be able to work with, 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 with you and Governor Whitmer on these critical uh, opportunities to support innovation uh, and to and to really change uh, change our business uh, for the better is it's been is a great opportunity. So I want to thank you for for being with us today, and uh, we look forward to more engagement um, also at the Center for Automotive Research uh, Management Briefing Seminars as well as going forward. So I want to thank you very much for being here today. John, I appreciate that. I appreciate the alliance. I appreciate CAR and the the leadership that. Uh, is being demonstrated here. We, again, we all have a role to play in our collective success, whether that is our collective response to COVID-19, whether that is our collective response to creating a new reality of racial equity, or a collective response of enabling prosperity um, to every person in every community in every part of our state. And um, I believe that is achievable if we set our mind to it and we set our resources toward it. And, and so I'm, I'm proud to be able to, to stand tall with all of you to do that together. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Carla Bailo again. I hope you enjoyed the conversation that you just listened to featuring Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist and uh, moderated by John Bozella. My thanks to both of them for participating in the introductory session to MBS. Again, if you have not registered, you, there's still ample time to do so. Please go to cargroup.org, MBS events register. Thank you again. Have a great day.